this is uh, now the first chapter done. And uh, we are continuing with a uh, much more uh, varied, uh, so to say, uh, set of biomass, which comes from uh, side streams of uh, agriculture, primary production, or food processing. Uh, we we found an uh, in-house presenter of this as well, even though I must say that uh, Gasan Kostojnik uh, is a colleague of ours that wears now two hats. So the first one is uh, leading the lab uh, and the chair of uh, biochemistry and food chemistry at our faculty. And uh, the hat he's taking on as well is also uh, starting to lead the Center for Carbon-Free Technologies at the Chemistry Institute. Um, so we have a capable presenter who cannot be today with us, unfortunately. Uh, he's leading another uh, yes, uh, scientific meeting in Serbia at the moment. So uh, we, I apologize in the name of the group that uh, this uh, presentation is a pre-recorded one. Uh, so you'll be uh, following the recordings. But please, if you have any comments, any questions to, to ask, uh, we'll try to address those. If we will be will not be able to do that, we'll pass them on to Gasan, and he will come back to you. So, um, uh, so now the uh, I'll pass to the uh, presentation of uh, Gasan. So, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Ilya Gasanosonik Chernivets. I'm a researcher at the National Institute of Chemistry, as well as assistant professor in agri food chemistry at the University of Ljubljana. And today we'll be going through a general overview on biomass streams from the agri food sector, so availabilities, properties, as well as opportunities of how to use them more efficiently. Uh, the food system is widely integrated in many aspects of our lives. So from this slide, it comes as no surprise that it also has an immense environmental impact. And if we look into the European consumption, the consumption of food represents a good third of the overall climate impact. So furthermore, if, if we look into these different impact layers, uh, the European food system then generates an average requirement of 3.6 times of the planetary boundary. Therefore, it is not sustainable in the present form. And when you talk about biomass and food systems, of course, we have to start in the agricultural production. Uh, and in agricultural production on the European level, 1 billion tons of biomass is sourced from agriculture. Um, and if we then transform this 1 billion tons to its energy equivalent, we can then talk about uh, producing or outputting around 20 exajoules of primary energy per year in the European Union. And a third of that is generated by residues of crop production. So in total, three quarters of residual biomass is not extracting, but at the same time, energy crops contribute much less energy equivalents. So this is something to think about. Um, there is a big um, gap or a big uh, amount of energy output that is not being e extracted at the moment. And then we have energy crops which are generating around uh, five percent of primary energy equivalent at the same time, so much less. And also, we have to take in account that forty percent of um, European land uh, is used for agriculture. Um, and then, if you move on to the food system, food processing generates a very diverse array of production residues, byproducts, and waste waste biomass. So this really um, the destiny of processing residues really affects how well we can view the opportunities for bio-based solution into the food uh, processing or in the food sector today. 
so basically everything that is not a primary product is a processing residue. So coming out from this circle here that says production, we have a processing residue stream and basing it on its destiny, um, it, it is then further defined. So what wasted amounts are very well recorded in the European Union. From agriculture and processing uh, on a yearly level, there is 55 million tons uh, reported per year of waste. Um, and then if these same biomass or processing residues are not wasted, but are used in some kind of way. So meaning if we use it in the same production process, if we use it in another company, if farmers use it for feed and so on, then the same processing residue becomes a byproduct. Uh, and this by-processing, uh, sorry, these byproduct amounts are not known, but if we just crunch some numbers really quickly, then we can understand that the majority of the underutilized food processing biomass is actually located in this orange arrow. Uh, for example, just three um, byproducts uh, on the European level coming out of the oil. Uh, beer and cheese production, uh, and you can see that they meet the reported waste amount. So when we understand this, we can also kind of understand that it is really important that we are constantly on the lookout beyond the st statistical data for less well-managed biomass. Uh, because the food processing biomass is so highly diverse, and fragmented, uh, let's rather look at some examples. So this is from our own research group, uh, how we can approach solutions for unused biomass. So here we look at some examples for plant production residues. Um, so for example, onion skin. Onion skin represents in its dry weight around one sixth to one fourth of the overall produce, produce dry mass. And it can be then used either as a direct food ingredient, it can be used, uh, uh, it can be stored for cooking or for diet supplementation, uh, or it can also be extracted and then used as a functional additive or functional ingredient for shelf life preservation, in this case, for a high quality food product. Uh, and then Usually when we are extracting something of value uh, in the agri-food uh, industrial residues, we are usually also leaving some high fiber content. So in this example, you can see you have onion skins, you have uh, cuttings from olive groves, and you have pomegranate peels, which all have their own bioactive content. But once we remove them, there's still a lot of fibers and lignin left over. So after extraction, we are left with a rich fibrous fraction and then can be used for some kind of functional materials. In this case, uh, here you have an example of papers. Um, so you can get some papers with some unique properties and this can be obtained to give value for packaging, promotion materials, and so on. Uh, this can be especially interesting uh, for organic production or for some kind of luxury or limited edition product or some other special, um, some kind of similar special product as well. Uh, and then this overlook coming from the plant residue all the way down for all of these different cascading approaches and then gives an idea how we can change our focus when we are considering these streams. Um, and also on top of all of these uh, stream amounts or with all of these quantities, there is also a category of biomass that we actually have to largely prevent. And this is food waste and a sixth of food is wasted on a global level. Uh, and also in the European Union, this is generating large amounts and large corresponding costs. And you can see within the member states, 
we have quite a big variety of, of food waste generation between the member states here. Uh, and in average, uh, uh, half of the food waste comes from households, a third of food waste comes from uh, primary production and processing, and another fifth comes from uh, um, so sales and services. And if we then look at it, so this was a, this is a, um, a food waste structure which was done now quite some time ago, but it will give you the kind of idea of what is in food waste. Uh, and you can see that it is strongly represented uh, by its plant sources. So if we can understand uh, unavoidable food waste parts and how we can use them, uh, the um, understanding bioeconomy approaches for byproducts. Um, and there we also have some kind of overlap uh, for using uh, this food waste. So there is in, in byproduct utilization, in inedible parts from the food industry, there is also some parallel to the unavoidable food waste use. Um, but here, when we are talking about using food waste, or reducing food waste by using uh, of these uh, streams that could become food waste, we really need to demonstrate a certain stewardship. So first, by large, food waste has to be prevented, then reduced. Uh, and the main cause of food waste is food accumulation. And this can be avoided, of course, uh, in the very early stages by using this surplus for people, and then what is not suitable for human consumption, but still beneficial for animals we can use for feed. And then all the rest, all the other approaches come after that. So to sum it all up, uh, the utilization of agri-food biomass needs to follow first uh, food waste reduction measures. So this is what is marked here by Roman numerals one and two. Um, and then Going on, moving on to byproducts in and inedible parts. First, we can reprocess them if possible. And then, if we cannot reprocess them, then we need to separate them into valuable fractions. So, we need to uh, recover bioactives, we need to recover fibers. And then, the remaining material can be made available for chemical transformation. And final decompositions, which then results in energy production and so on. So this is a kind of cascading approach or a stewardship approach to uh, considering agri-food biomass use. Uh, so also to touch base on a couple of promising applications that are moving into small-scale production uh, in all of these different levels of agri-food biomass utilization. Uh, we have some interesting complication in small scale coming into new food development. So either generating a functional food ingredient, something that gives a color and an aroma or something like this. So this could be just a, a food ingredient, not an actually a food um, additive that you bring or something that you mix into the recipe with an, with, with a, from a natural source. Uh, then what is really current in the field now is combining uh, dietary fibers on one side. So you get a byproduct which is rich in dietary fibers, and then you combine it with the byproduct that is, for example, rich in protein. Uh, and that can be reformulated or it can be restructured into a new food. Uh, but by the way, that is also a very good combination um, for mild fermentation approaches and generating new food from mild fermentation approaches. Uh, and there is also some technology uh, which is new, newly available or interesting for this new food development from the point of uh, generating new structure properties, uh, new preparation technologies, and so forth. Um, on the level of functional component recovery, there is constantly new extraction machinery moving into small scale. So, for example, recently ultrasound or this kind of cavitation or similar to cavitation based extraction processes. Um, and then moving on to fiber, 
polymerization or fiber use solution for be are becoming commercially available for um, non-wood based paper and packaging production. And on the end of the line, there are now advances in biochar, nutrient recovery, biogas use, and so on. Um, and what this uh, yellow square or yellow rectangle here is also addressing is the new wave um, of biomass use or the new wave of uh, food system uh, uh, for the transformation of food systems to become more sustainable, which is especially relevant for traditional um, production system that are traditionally very linear. Uh, so here um, there is envisaged uh, fields such as energy farming, so producing your own energy or producing also some kind of energy carrier that you can move also from the point of production. Uh, at the same time, or on the side, also producing biogenic CO2 and producing biogenic chemicals for wider industrial use. Uh, and this is not by means of interfering by the food production process, but on the side. So um using a side stream or using side capacities uh, to generate this what actually retaining or even increasing the levels of food production so yeah this is all from me and i thank you for your attention if you're interested in further discussion of course i'm available and you can use the contacts on the slide so yeah i hope you like this short talk and feel free to get in touch